So what's up guys, it's Monty here, I'm back again. Today I'm going to talk about a little book called A Little Life. <sighs> I didn't really think about making a review of this because I didn't review the last book I read, 1Q84, or I didn't upload that review because the video was like weird and wonky. And so I didn't know if I was going to review A Little Life in a video format, but I finished it today on the 30th of December, 2016, and I have so many thoughts, and even while I was reading it, I was very angry at this book, and I was very hateful and resentful, and when I try to keep this review calm, and it is going to be long, I have a feeling. It might be like 45 minutes. So if you're here for spoilers, uh, it'll be long. I'll, I'll, but let's just get to my quick general thoughts in case you don't have 45 minutes. Um, the writing, I listen to an audiobook. So I, I can't tell you how it reads if you read it for yourself. But coming from the audiobook, um, the writing was fine. I enjoyed it somewhat to a degree. There were moments in the book where I thought that things were annoying or overwritten. Um, there were a lot of points in the book, actually, I thought that it was overwritten in the sense that we would be talking about something like, I don't know, one of the characters walking to the couch or something. And on the way to the couch, something would happen or we would get to the couch and then they would start reminiscing about something else. And it was just, it was, it was weird. And in a way, it reminded me of 1Q84, and it reminded me of Gone with the Wind. And I know in my review of Gone with the Wind, I said that I really liked the writing and the description of everything. And I didn't Gone with the Wind. But I felt like Gone with the Wind was different in a way. Because I feel like Gone with the Wind wasn't solely relying on the characters to move the plot forward. A Little Life very much is a character study. And I feel that the premise that most people talk about, about being a book about friendship and which it kind of is, but I feel like people talk about A Little Life on the basis that the story revolves around the four friends, which I would entirely disagree with. Um, I feel that it is very much a character study in Jude and in pain and in loss and in suffering in the extremest forms, but there's a difference when you're doing a character study and you're going really deep into tangents. And what Margaret Mitchell did in Gone with the Wind, I feel that Margaret Mitchell, because there was the plot of, you know, of surviving also, of, of loss also, but there was also the war going on, and so there was that kind of a plot to go along with, and even though, and then after the War of the Reconstruction era plot to go along with, there was other things to bolster the character, excuse me, the character analysis that Margaret Mitchell was doing. Whereas here, there isn't anything else. Like, this is straight up, these are our four characters, but we're going to focus on Jude. So, with that being said, I feel that the book was overwritten, and I do think that it dragged on for too long, especially because there was a part towards the end, I think it's book part five, chapter three, it's the second to last chapter of the book, I feel that it is entirely unnecessary. Um, I feel that you could have eliminated that chapter and you still could have had the moment at the end of the book that we'll get to in a little bit and everything would have been the same. So I feel like there were parts of the book that weren't necessary. There were things that were said that weren't necessary. And even though in the moment I was like, you know what, I'm here for this, I'll, I'll listen to it. In the grand scheme of things, it didn't add much to the story. Aside from that, um, the characters are all right. Uh, I don't feel that they grow, even though you spend literal decades with them. I still feel that they're frozen in their college selves. I don't think that there's any progression, uh, progression in their sense of who they are as a person, in their sense of anything. To be quite frank, I don't. Uh, I wouldn't think that you would spend literally like. 40 years with characters and they're still the same as when you met them so I feel like the character growth was non-existent um and I just 
I feel that it failed on multiple levels, and in good conscience, I can't recommend this book to anybody. If it's on your TBR list, and you've been looking forward to it, I, I mean, go for it. You might have a vastly different opinion than I do, but now we're gonna start talking about things more in depth, and so from here on out, for the rest of the video, there will be spoilers. I'm gonna try to remain calm and drink my water and not use expletives to uh, the nth degree. Let's let's go. I first want to address the pain in this book, and I've watched other people's reviews and I've uh, read some other people's reviews because the book's been out for like a year, two years now, something like that. It's been out for a while, so people have commented on this and they reviewed it to death. Which is another reason why I initially wasn't going to review it, but maybe in recording this I'll have emptied my thoughts and I can move on with my life. But people, I feel, in their reviews of the book focus on the pain that Jude felt. Which makes sense because, like I said, uh, people describe the book as a tale of four friends and they're journey through life together, which I wholeheartedly disagree with, but we'll get to that in a second. I'm going to focus on the traumatic story of these characters' pasts, specifically Jude, which I will get to in a moment, but I want to start with Willem, because there's a, be there's a portion at the beginning of the book that I distinctly recall, even though I must have listened to it back in April or May, a long months ago, months ago. So there's a portion at the beginning of the book where... Uh, we're learning about Willem's backstory and how his parents had a farm in Montana, I want to I, I wanna think it was, somewhere back east Wyoming, at Wyoming. You think I would remember that because I was born there, there'd be like some kind of sentimental relationship, but whatever. Um, there's, ooh, that was cold, just spilled water all over my foot. Um, God, there's a moment where uh, it just, where Hania Yanagahara discusses how uh, he had a sister, I believe, two, two siblings, for short, who died very young before Willem came, al came around. And then uh, Willem had a brother, Hemet, and then his parents had Willem. So two of their four children survived. But Hemet, who I think was older than Willem, but he might have been younger, I, I don't really remember. He, I just know he was his brother. Um, Hemet had, I want to say, it was cerebral palsy. He had some kind of developmental disability that left him confined to a wheelchair and how his parents, they didn't really want him it and they felt more that they had to take care of him out of obligation, which I could understand that kind of a narrative going on, like fine. But then when Hemet dies, they don't tell Willem, who at this point is off at college and which, I mean, I could... I really just, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it at all. Um, particularly because Hemet and Willem had been so close, but when Hemet dies, they don't tell him. Like, they don't initially tell him. They, I think he finds out, like, when he goes home or something, or they tell him a couple days later. But that is something that happens to him. So he's already lost, he's, his family's already lost these two siblings, and then he loses Hemet. And then the year after that, he loses his father, I think. And then the year after that, he loses his mother. And he becomes an orphan, and all he has are Jude, Malcolm, and JB. And now I want to talk about Jude for a minute, because in my watching other people's reviews, I've heard through them, and I haven't verified this myself, so feel free to leave comments in the comment section if I'm wrong. But from what I've gathered is Hanya Yanagahara wanted Jude to be a vessel to talk about sexual abuse. And that it was intended for it to be as prolonged and unbelievable as it was. But let me illustrate this for you. Jude was abandoned as a baby in a dumpster. Fine. I mean, yeah, it's like the punchline of jokes on like sitcoms and things, but it happens in real life. I get it. Social Services then takes him to a monastery. I think that's what happened. I mean, and I guess one of the brothers might have found him and took him to the monastery, but at some point social services would have been involved, and for them to just leave him at the monastery doesn't make sense. But he's at the monastery now. He's a baby at the monastery until he's eight years old, 
and over those eight years, by at least two or three of the brothers at the monastery, he is sexually abused. You know what? Fine. Why not? Sure, that happened. After that, at eight years old, he is taken by Brother Luke because he and Brother Luke are close. And they're going to go live in a cabin in the woods together. Fine. Like, that's obviously not going to happen, but for the sake of the story, why not? I'll believe it. Let's go. After that, he becomes a child prostitute because uh, Brother Luke forces him to sleep with grown men other than get a job and take care of them. So they're living literally off of the sex money that he made, that he makes off of uh, Jude. Fine. Whatever. Then Brother Luke himself starts to sleep with him in addition to all these other people. Sure. All the other brothers were having sex with him. Of course, the one brother who wasn't suddenly is going to start doing it. Like, fine. Fine. Then he witnesses Brother Luke die be when the police burst in and take him to a group home, which makes sense. At this point, he's 15. 15 is uh, most foster parents don't take in teenagers like that. It's very rare. So it makes sense that he would get put in a group home. What doesn't make sense is that several of the counselors and therapists at that group home would then start to sexually abuse him. It doesn't make sense. Uh, then after that, he finally runs away and he is going across trip across America where again he becomes a prostitute and is abused and used by truck drivers all over the country. Uh, in Philadelphia, he is picked up by a psychiatrist apparently when he is sleeping at a train st uh, truck stop where he is locked in a basement given medicine to help get rid of his venereal you know, sexually transmitted diseases and is later abused by this person who also runs him over with a car and if you were to believe the story after this when he is he is at this age now after that incident is when he gets accepted into a college which doesn't make sense because when he's at the monastery he doesn't really do any I mean he, he takes lessons and when he's with a brother Luke he takes lessons and for the hot second that he's at the uh, the group home he does take college courses at the local community college in addition to like his regular college classes but at this point, you would think that his education is so fragmented and broken that he wouldn't be able to get into a college at 16, but he is just the uh, most intelligent person ever, I guess. And the, <laughs> the situation of his, uh, trying to get comfortable here, uh, all of that was irrelevant. But, <laughs> and then even after... Uh, that his next relationship with Caleb, Caleb uh, rapes and abuses him because his parents were sick all his adult life and he doesn't like seeing wheelchairs or people in wheelchairs and so he just rapes Jude instead of breaking up with him like a normal person and then after they do break up, he... <laughs> and I shouldn't laugh about this because this is a serious subject, I, but this was just so stupid to me that after Caleb and Jude break up, that Caleb would then break into Jude's house, rape him repeatedly, and then throw him down a flight of stairs and leave him for dead. Like, <sighs> I have here The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest by Steve Larson, and I have a review of this whole series on my channel. In this, Elizabeth Salander deals with her own sexual abuse. She deals, there's issues of sex trafficking. Uh, that's mainly in this one and it, uh, the one before it, the girl, who picked, uh, the girl Who Played With Fire. Like, this series deals with abuse and loss and similar themes as A Little Life and does them on a much better level because when you're reading it, it's mostly like Hanya was like, you know, what can I do to make this so extreme and so uncomfortable for the reader that one, they don't want to know any more of it because it's not doled out at once. It's doled out over the course of 700 pages intermittently. Uh, and so 
it's not like, oh, we know everything up front. It's you learn things over the course of the novel. And when you first start learning about it, you're like, oh my goodness, this is so terrible. But by the third time you start hearing about the, the next grown person that would abuse him, it's kind of like they're the only person in his adult life that does not abuse him in some way who he has a relationship with is Malcolm. JB, although that one is kind of like he does like hurt Jude, but not in a sexual sense. So I'm not gonna I'm gonna count him as one of the good people. And Harold. Those are the three people in Jude's life that do not abuse him in some way. And people will fight me on Willem. And I wanna talk about this right here, right now. People who say that Willem is a good character, I have an issue with. People who like him and think he's a good match for Jude, I have an issue with. Because there are several times in the novel that make it very clear, very clear that even if he doesn't punching him like Caleb did, or throwing him down the stairs, he is still using Jude. There's a point in the novel where Willem is thinking about how if his career ever dried up and he didn't have any income anymore, he could sell his apartment uptown and he would move in with Jude and he would use his money from selling the apartment to go back to school so he could work with children with a disability because Jude would always be there to take care of him. And then when Willem and Jude become a couple, it becomes clear later on that Willem knew that Jude didn't want to have sex and he wasn't comfortable with it but he still did it anyway and he still wanted to have it with Jude and they did for months. For months they had sex and for all those months Willem knew that Jude did not want to have it. So he was still using Jude in the same way that Caleb used him, in the same way that Brother Luke used him, in the same way the truck drivers used him, in the same way the creepy psychiatrist dude used him. Literally all the men that ever used Jude in his childhood Willem was just as bad. And even after they had the, uh, it wasn't until later on in the novel where they had a fight and they talked it over that Willem finally stopped having sex with Jude. But at that point, he had already used him for like 18 months of their relationship. That the fact that he stopped having sex with him, you know, for the rest of it, for, you know, a couple decades after that, to me, I wasn't okay with it. I wasn't down with it. I'm not here for it because you still new and to me that's it's it fuck willem like fuck fuck willem i'm gonna i'm gonna move on now because i know if i if i stay here on this part uh i'm going to be even more upset i want to move on to another thing that people talk about as i adjust uh and that is the the friendship for the first half of the book i would believe that this is a book about these four friends about jude and willem and jb and malcolm but there's some point before the halfway point that jb doesn't really become relevant and he does have a chapter later on but it's mostly about how he is complaining that he's overweight and a drug addict and he didn't get to become skinny like all the other drug addicts and he doesn't want to clean his like art studio, but he has to go and clean it anyway. And then we go on to talk about all the other people in the art studio for no reason. And it's inconsequential. Malcolm drops off in significance way before JB does. I mean, there's they're both still there and they're both still relevant. Like, I don't want to say relevant, they're, both, they're still present in the story, but not in the way that Willem is always omnipresent always there and really I would describe a little I would describe a little life as a character analysis of Jude and his life and because Willem is so important to him Willem the white two white characters get to stay there where JB and Malcolm the two black friends are pushed aside and I will say that I know that someone out there who might not comment on this video, but I know that these people are out there because if you look on the tag on Tumblr, if you look through people's reviews, people were, you're destined to find that people are very happy that there are LGBTQ 
LGBTQ characters in the background and the people of color in the background mixed and mingled in various combinations and such. None of the people of color in this book are in any way consequential. JB and Malcolm are both black, I believe. Uh, there's a point where Malcolm, towards the beginning of the book, doesn't know if he can be considered black because I think Malcolm comes from like an, a very wealthy family. And so he talks about how he didn't know if he could be considered black and he was post-black because he hadn't struggled in life. And because he hadn't struggled, he didn't think he could call himself black. And that's why he was post-black, whatever the fuck that means. And then you have Malcolm, who comes from, I think, I mean, uh, JB, uh, John Baptiste Marion, who is a Haitian American. And he is raised by his mother and his grandmother and his uh, lesbian aunt who is really just thrown in to be the lesbian aunt, and she's not really there anymore. <laughs> um, uh, JB, who's, like, he becomes a drug addict, and I guess he's overweight, apparently, uh, and he's a very successful artist. All the people in this book are successful. Uh, JB is a successful artist. Malcolm is a su su uh, successful architect. Uh, Jude becomes the best lawyer at this very high and mighty law firm. Willem becomes a very highly regarded actor, and you get to hear all about his films and his shooting schedule that you really don't care because they don't add anything to the plot, but they're there in the book. And I mean, some of the projects aren't interesting, but again, they're not really important to anything. They just are there to sound interesting. Some of the times, uh, the way that these things are being shot make no fucking sense. And I'm just like, that's not what a studio would do ever. Like a studio is not going to hire two directors and have one director shoot this one character and have another director shoot this other character and just have like these totally two different styles and mash them up and just be a singular movie like that didn't make any fucking sense to me but at that point the book was almost over so I was like you know what Hanya I don't care about this project anyway it's not real I'll just I'll just listen to it and we can move on and he's dead anyway which I'm gonna get to at the end I'm gonna talk about all these deaths but right now I'm talking about race and Hanya Yanagahara because I sincerely think that she fucked up um, I think Jude is supposed to be implied to be racially ambiguous but really he just seemed really white to me like he was fucking Wonder Bread, like, whatever. Willem is Swedish, and so you have the two black friends who are just not important in the story at all. Like, Malcolm designs the houses that they all live in, and he does all the remodeling and stuff. So in that sense, he's important. He's always mentioned. He's always there. You always know that when uh, one of them talks about their friends or who they're going to see for this holiday or that holiday or what they're going to do for this summer or that summer or this vacation or that vacation, you'll hear about Malcolm and you'll get to hear about what he's doing and what he's up to, but he won't really ever be there for, you know, himself to, to, to talk and to explain and have chapters from him to the audience, at, like, bef after the halfway point, really, in my opinion. So you lose him. You lose JB a little bit after the halfway point. Uh, he just, he's again there, but not really there. Uh, there are the two characters that really annoyed me are Black uh, Henry Young and Asian Henry Young, only because they are so indistinguishable from one another that they're always referred to as Black Henry Young and Asian Henry Young. And I'm like, you know what? I mean, I could understand if you have a friend with like the same exact name that you would need to differentiate them in some way, but I also think that your friends would be so different, even if they have the same name and they're both artists, that you would still be able to distinguish them. And maybe it's just a thing of, you know, in writing, that's how she chose to do it. But again, they're so interchangeable, so interchangeable, that the only way that they're different differentiated is by saying Asian Henry Young and Black Henry Young. And they're there. And I think one of them is gay, but I don't really know. So many people in this book are gay or lesbian. Like, JB, I know, is gay. Uh, Malcolm is straight. Willem, d d he, d there's no real label that's applied to him. Uh, some people in the reviews talk about how he's gay. Um, if you were to put a label on it, it makes more sense, in my opinion, for him to be uh, bisexual or just pansexual or just straight who happened to fall for Jude. Jude himself also never uh, ascribes himself a sexual orientation. Some people say that he's asexual. I would vehemently disagree with that because uh, the book makes it very clear that 
the only reason he has issues with sex are because of his childhood trauma with brother Luke and being forced into, you know, child prostitution and that sort of a thing. Um, I mean, if you're an asexual person and you identify with Jude, more power to you. I just, personally, I don't think that's what Jude is. I don't really know, though, because, again, he doesn't... To me, he's more, you know, sexually ambiguous, and it doesn't really matter to me personally because he's not interested in sex anyway with anybody, so his sexual orientation isn't, isn't as important. So if he is asexual, more power to him. I still think that everything that happened to him is outrageous and that he isn't really a character. He's more of just an, a piece of paper uh, because the only real personality trait that he has is he's very timid and he's very uh, ashamed. That's really all that there is to him as a person is always a timid shyness meekness uh ashamed quality to just about everything he does and it's just like I, I feel bad criticizing him because of the things that he's gone through but at the same time they were written so fantastically um in such an irrational irreverent way that i feel that i mean <laughs> And I might feel differently if I didn't have the background that I do uh, with the foster care system, with people who've actually been sexually abused, that to write his character in the way that it was written just really bothers me. And maybe if I wasn't a black person, I would be okay with just this peppering of minorities in the background of your story. But I'm not, because the two black leads you have are axed halfway through the book, and they're just sort of peppered in later on for this or that there's no real agency or consequence to any of their actions because it's the jude st francis show and the william ragnarsson role uh and william or willem is a fucking piece of shit to me because he's sitting over here having sex with people when he knows they don't want it so you just have jude who's a piece of paper and all these other minorities in the background don't do anything they're literally just there they're i mean it makes it feel like a more real New York City, unlike other books in New York that I've read, like The Devil Wears Prada, where it's it didn't feel like New York City at all. And it's better than other books I've read, like the Chad Colton books, which, I mean, in the average American marriage and male, there is a black character that he leaves his white girlfriend for, but that's like the only person of color in the books. Um, and then in marriage, he cheats on his black girlfriend or wife at this point uh, with uh, a I shouldn't talk spoilers about that, but, uh, like, it, it's better, uh, the Robert Galbraith books, I don't really believe there's all that a diversity, so in, like, that sense, it's nice that even if they don't have any agency or any consequence, they're not there to do anything, they're just mentioned, the same with the, uh, LGBTQIA plus people, they're just kind of there in the background, but they don't do anything. They, they're they not important. And then the one you do have at the forefront, uh, Willem and Jew, they don't prescribe to any identity or any label. So even to label them, I feel, is wrong because it's not something that they're choosing for themselves. There's even a point in the book where Willem could choose to label himself as gay after he and Jude enter this relationship. But Willem consciously chooses not to. And he says, I'm not that. I'm just this i'm me i'm willem and i just happen to be in love with jude and you know what that's that's his truth that's him so i'm gonna go with that and i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna let him and his piece of shit ways do what he needs to do because at the end of the day i don't care about willem i don't care about jude and i don't care about malcolm or jb and you know what neither does hanya yanagahara because at the end of the day after i listened to this book for 32 hours this is a 32-hour book that I had to sit down and listen to. It was a pre-determined length of time that I listened to this book. I mean, I did start the book in April, and I just picked it up again a couple of days ago, so it wasn't like it was actually 36 hours or 32 hours. Like, it was, it's been a giant chunk of my years, this book, thinking about this book, even when I wasn't actively listening to it. <laughs> that... just 
I feel that this really could have been a good book. I feel that Jude could have been a good person. I feel that maybe with a little more time, a little more editing, uh, that Henry Youngs could have been more differentiated, that the, the actual race aspect of the book could have been handled so much better because there's so much unnecessary bullshit in this book. There's so much filler and fluff and just prose that it, it li when you listen to it, at least for me, I could enjoy. But when you're done at the end of the day, and the way that Hanya chose to end it, to get back to what I was saying, is infuriating. <sighs> in my non-spoilers brief five-minute section of this video, I said that the second, the second to last chapter was unnecessary, and really, here's why. For 40 years, really closer to 30, a little over 30, uh, no, well, I'm pretty sure they've known each other 40 years, might be 30, they know each other for most of their adult lives, okay? Most of their adult lives, uh, Willem and JB and Malcolm and Jude know each other, uh, and for all of that time, Jude is cutting himself because that's what Brother Luke taught him to do to help cleanse himself. So that's what Jude does. Jude hurts himself. So in addition to all his sexual baggage, he's a cutter. So if you don't like blood and you're squeamish, this is not the book for you. Uh, it's, it's not the book for anybody, really. But if you are determined to read this, I'm going to... Then you're still sticking around for these spoilers 32 minutes in. There you go. But for this entire time... He's been cutting himself. Uh, there's a point early in the book where he tries or almost commits suicide. He's exsanguinating. And his doctor, uh, Andy, who is also in the book, laughably a lot, um, just continuously let this happen. Like, and in reality, I refuse to believe that someone could be doing this for so long. For having two suicide attempts under their belt. They have almost killed themselves twice. They have continued to cut themselves this entire time. At one point, Jude burns himself. At uh, another point, he's throwing himself into the shower walls. He's, you know, throwing himself downstairs. I mean, that's usually when he's uh, younger and, and things. But he's self-destructive. I understand that's how he's coping with his trauma that has been inflicted upon him in this amazing amount. But there's a couple of scenes that really stand out to me. One of the scenes is after Jude and Willem become a couple of that's when it really becomes a problem for Willem. Like, early on in their college years, it was kind of a problem for Willem, but not enough to try to get him any help. Uh, and I understand that after they become a couple at this point, I think, uh, no. I think it's this, the scene I'm talking about, um, I think Jude had already tried to commit suicide for the second time. So there's a whole lot of drama here with the cutting and, the, and everything. But there's a scene where Willem walks in and he sees Jude cutting himself, and he takes the razor from Jude, and he cuts himself on the chest six times rather deeply, uh, the, the really intense Jack cuts on his chest. And the reason it stands out to me is, one, he's screaming and yelling at Jude, and this won't be the last time. Another time he'll climb on top of him, knowing that his boyfriend slash life partner has been raped repeatedly as a child. He will still force himself onto him, uncloak him, so he can see the cuts that bothered me but here this happened uh after we had the second explanation of uh jude telling willem that he had had all these stis stds uh diseases uh, from his time being a you know a sex slave being molested being raped all those things um and he had been he had there were you know consequences for that he had had diseases so for him to then later take the razor blade that had just been used to cut his Jude and just use it on himself, there were no consequences that didn't make any sense to me because you would think if it was serious enough, serious enough to tell your partner about that you, you would still be suffering the ramifications. And I mean, maybe he was like that, I guess. That could have been the weird disease that Jude had on his legs where he kept getting sores and things that never was really explained to me in a satisfactory way. Um, but the consequences of uh, while well, I'm cutting himself with the, the blade, uh, they never really seem to appear other than obviously he was in pain, but for whatever reason, 
Jude cutting himself became a huge, huge, huge problem for Willem after they became a couple and after they were together. And that bothered me because it was like, this isn't new information. This isn't something that just happened. Like, you are now in your 40s. Like, you are 44 years old. Like, damn near 50. Like, so, I mean, obviously Jude is not going to change overnight at this point. But also, you have to understand that this is something that you've been aware of. So the fact that this has been going on and Andy knew about it and you knew about it and this is still happening boggled the mind. Because Andy's his doctor. And you would think that something would happen. And I mean, something does happen after the second suicide attempt. He is in a psychiatric ward. But that lasts all of five seconds because he doesn't talk to the therapist and they let him go. And so then at the end of the book... Um, I was just listening, and then all of a sudden, Willem was dead, and Malcolm was dead, and Malcolm's wife slash girlfriend slash love interest was also dead. Like, it was just a random car accident. And of course, you can see it coming, because all of these things happen in Jude's life. Obviously, Willem's gonna die. Like, it's just, it has to. Because he can't have a, a, a man in his life that doesn't want to hurt him, unless you're JB, Malcolm, or Harold, because like I said, Willem is a fuck-off. Um... So now you've killed off one of the main black people in your book after you did nothing with him, and Willem is dead. And so then we get this chapter of Jude mourning, but it's all pointless. Like, there's a, there's a lot of talk about how he tried to starve himself, but he realized he couldn't do that. But if he didn't eat, like, he, if he forced himself not to eat for long enough, he'd get to hallucinate and he'd get to see Willem. And then the, the last chapter is told in first person. This is the second time it happens, because there's two points in the book where you get the story told from Harold's point of view and both of those times it's told from first person and that's when you find out that Jude is dead and I have to be happy I, I, I'm gonna be really honest with you when I heard that Jude was dead I didn't care I was happy I guess um but I really didn't care but what really pissed me the fuck off was after I found out that Jude was dead I found out that JB had died that all these other characters had just died and I was just sitting there like why like, none of these other characters were important. You've already killed off your four friends, and I guess people are selling this book on, like, this idea that this book is about friendship. And there are some really good quotables. Like, if you go on Tumblr and you go into the little tag, and you see all the quotes that people be posting, like, they will move you. Like, they are genuinely moving quotes. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if you got them, like, blown up and then hung them on your wall. Because, like, there are some really good lines in there about how, why isn't friendship the same as a platonic love? And why do you have to, you know, why is sex so important when you when you know just two people who are just choosing to be together because they genuinely care about each other and they're just there and there's nothing romantic about it like they're just there for each other like that's a totally valid thing and there's other lines in there that are just as good as that one i mean obviously my paraphrase version isn't good but when it's in the context it's a good line and <laughs> it's a nice quotable but it never really materialized in the book because you have Willem and Jude form a romantic relationship and that was your backbone friendship thing. You toss out Malcolm, you toss out JB, they're not really consequential characters anymore. You focus on Willem and Jude and Harold and his wife, uh, I think her name, I don't remember her name, I, I, I can't, at the, uh, Julia. All of these characters are white so at the, at the forefront of your novel about friendship you have a romantic relationship. Uh, I guess the platonic relationship between Jude and Harold, because Harold adopts Jude at one point in the novel. So you have, like, this familial relationship, but you also have this romantic one, and Jude and, and uh, Gerald, I mean, Julia and Harold are a romantic relationship. You toss out the friendship halfway through the novel, and you focus on this love interest. <laughs> so it's not about the friendship anymore. You don't get to have these moving things about friendship when you have Willem taking advantage of Jude like you just don't get to go there and at the end of the day I have massive problems with this book um if you stuck around long like this long into the video I'm gonna I'm gonna stop talking now because I'm damn near at that 45 minute mark and I know no one's gonna watch a 45 minute video like eight people might watch this like 20 years from now but this book I feel has major problems I if you've read it, I would love to know what you thought of the book down below in the comment section. Uh, if you're planning on reading it, I would love to know. I'm just gonna, I, I have to go now. So, I hope you guys 
having a really good New Year's Eve. I'll see you guys in 2017. Uh, until next time.